The Canon EOS R8 costs around 1,500 US dollars and is thereby the cheapest option for a full frame mirrorless camera from Canon, at least if you want a quite recent one. Several years ago they announced the Canon EOS RP and the body of the RP and the EOS R8 are actually quite similar. However, many of the specs have changed. So instead of 4 frames per second in RAW mode and with continuous autofocus, we now get up to 40 frames per second. Also, the autofocus has been greatly improved, it can now detect diff very different uh, subjects and it also features a new sensor which is actually the same one as the R6 Mark II. I had the opportunity to test this camera for several days out in the wild taking pictures and video of wildlife, flowers and landscapes. So after a bit more than 4000 pictures this is definitely not a long term re review but I want to share with you my experiences with the camera, what is good, where you might need to do quite some sacrifices and compromises. So that's what this video is about and I can already tell you right now I was really amazed by this camera. So as I said, the body is very small and lightweight, especially if we compare it to a R5. This one weighs around 460 grams with the battery and card included. I think the R5 is around 740 and you can definitely feel the difference in weight and also in size. I think the R8 still has a nice fit in your hands. If you have large hands, it might be a bit small. I think it's not so much of an issue if you use a small lens like a wide angle um, I don't know, a 14 to 35 or a 50 millimeter prime. However, if you start using big tele lenses, it starts feeling a bit small, but overall I'm still quite happy with it. Of course, on a smaller body, you have less options for buttons and dials. So this one comes only with two dials, one here close to the shutter and one behind. As you might know, I prefer three dials, but I also need to say if we look at other manufacturers, even in their top tier cameras, they sometimes only provide two dials, so I think we cannot complain too much about this. Something else I thought I would complain a lot was the miss missing joystick. Missing if you come from an R5, R6, R7 or even an R10. Um, but actually it was not that big of a deal than I thought. So first of all the autofocus system, the animal eye detection and tracking is very good. I will come to that a bit later. But also if you set up the camera the proper way you can really also move the, uh, the autofocus point around fairly quickly with this pad down here with the keys or by using the touch and drag options. On the top of the camera we have a dedicated photo and video switch on the left which is highly welcome. Then we have a classical mode dial that also offers like a C1 and C2 settings. And then finally the on off switch which is in a really handy position so I can easily turn it on and off without uh, using my left hand. So even when handling a big telephoto lens, this is quite nice. On the back, of course, the touchscreen that can be articulated, tilted and everything. And then the viewfinder, which with 2.36 million dots is not very high resolution. Uh, it's also significantly smaller than the one of the R5. But again, remember the price point. And I think this is not a deal breaker. I could still easily see if the animal was sharp or not sharp in the picture. And I still had fun using it. The SD card slot of the camera is not on the side, but rather on the bottom, um, together with the battery, as we also know it from the R10. Um, so here is the SD card, and here you have the battery, which is quite small, I need to say. Um, I would say it still lasted more than half of the R5, but not too long. I mean, in the morning I was usually using two batteries, because one was emptied quite quickly, but again for the small body I think it's still okay and I actually expected worse. On the left side we have all the different connectors like for a remote control, um, the microphone, um, headphone jack, micro HDMI and USB-C which is quite handy because we can charge the camera over USB-C and as I said the battery life is not the best so maybe after a morning shooting you could take one battery out of the camera and charge it in the uh, in the charger that comes with the camera and the second battery you can charge in the camera by just connecting the camera to USB-C so that's definitely welcome. On the front you can see directly the sensor because this camera has, does not have 
or does not use the shutter as a mechanical shield like the R5 can. So this might be a bit more prone to dust. So I would be a bit more careful when changing the lenses. Let's just stick with the sensor. Um, it's a 24 megapixel full frame sensor. It's exactly the same one as we also have in the R6 Mark II. So if you want to see some image quality tests also compared to the R5, then please check out my R6 Mark II video. In short, I can just say I was very pleased with the image quality, the colors, the image look was very nice, noise was the low level, and there was really a lot of details in the picture. Of course, you see a difference to 45 megapixels, but I don't know, the sharpness was really good. I was really happy with the pictures. Um, and what's also nice is that the readout of the sensor is fairly quick. Of course, it's not a stacked sensor, but for a non-stacked sensor, it's really in the top in the top end, I would say, with a short readout speed similar to the R5. So usually I had no problems using the electronic shutter, but this might depend a bit on your shooting style. One key difference to the R6 Mark II is that the camera has no IBIS, so no embed body image stabilization. Um, for telephoto lenses, usually the IBIS is not helping so much anyway, but if you shoot with unstabilized lenses or with more wide angle lenses, um, yeah, you might see a bit of difference here and you might need a bit shorter shutter speed to still get sharp pictures. If we think back around 10 to 15 years how full frame entry-level full-frame cameras looked back then, they were usually slow and had not so good autofocus. This definitely changed in here. The autofocus options, the settings are exactly the same as on the R6 Mark II and from what I can tell the performance is also quite similar, which means it's on par with the R5 or maybe, maybe even slightly better. Again, I need to say after 4000 pictures I cannot make a final conclusion about this but I was very happy with the autofocus performance and it can definitely compete against the most expensive and best cameras that are out there at the moment. Nevertheless, I would not completely rely on the animal eye detection autofocus. I had no camera so far where this worked perfectly, so sometimes I still switch back to the single point or even the spot autofocus, use this at least to pre-focus, and if I have a good feeling, then I hand over again to the animal eye detection autofocus. The EOS R8 does actually not have a mechanical shutter, which is maybe why this shutter shield is missing. It only has a first electronic curtain shutter and a completely electronic shutter. With the first electronic curtain, as you might know, we have no risk of rolling shutter and we have the full bit depth. The downside are that it's quite loud and rather slow. It shoots six frames per second, which might be still adequate for some uh, scenes, but if you have a lot of action happening, you might want to use the electronic shutter because the electronic shutter works with up to 40 frames per second, which is just blazingly fast. If you shoot action, I would recommend using C-RAW and not RAW with this camera, because in RAW you hit the buffer after I think 50 frames or something, uh, which doesn't sound too bad, but if you think that you shoot 40 frames per second, this is not even one and a half seconds of continuous shooting and that's just too quickly reached in my opinion. If you switch to zero, Canon says that you can get up to 100 frames but before the camera gets slower. I did some tests and I actually managed around 137 to 140, so actually more than Canon claimed, but this always depends on your ISO, on your scene and so on. However, it's important to know once we hit the buffer limit, it takes quite a while to clear it. So I did some tests and the buffer was hit after three to three and a half seconds. And then it took around nine seconds where the camera was not taking a single picture, even if I kept pressing down. Um, and then it did another burst. This is a bit of different behavior than my R5. The R5 manages around 150 or 160 frames before it gets actually slower. And then it quickly stops. It does a few frames again, it stops, it does a few frames. So the, the, the speed definitely drops, but it's not completely blocked, at least until like 12 or 13 seconds after I started shooting, then it stopped completely. But before it was always going with a reduced rate, stopping, reduced rate, stopping. Um, this is just a different behavior. If you just press down the shutter button on both cameras for 15 seconds, the R8 will actually capture more images. But it's a burst in the beginning, then nothing in the burst in the end. And how many pictures you can get within 15 seconds depends on which card you use. So I was testing two cards, a bit of slower SanDisk card. With this I managed around 198, well let's say close to 200 pictures in these 15 seconds. With my Weiss SD card I managed around 270 frames, so significantly more. 
The R8 also offers the pre-burst, which is this mode where as soon as you half press the shutter, it starts taking pictures and just keeping them in the buffer. As soon as you properly hit the shutter, um, it's recording these pictures plus half a second of before you press the shutter, so 15 extra frames. I still don't like the setup of how this is done and I think it's only useful in very specific scenarios. So with the R8 I didn't really test it actually because there was no need for it. Um, I mentioned in my R6 Mark II video exactly what I don't like about this mode. This dedicated video switch on the top left already shows that it's a camera that is really a hybrid camera between photo and video and I was shooting a lot of video with it, actually almost more than uh, photos and it shoots oversampled 4K, so we get a really nice image quality in 4K, a lot of details. It can do 4K uh, 60 frames per second without a crop, but you can also dial in a crop, which can be useful in some situations for wildlife. The only downside is if you want uh, 120 frames per second, this is only available in full HD and not in 4K. Seems like this is reserved really for the R5 and the R3. There are some additional features that the R8 has and I wish the R5 would as well, such as the integrated focus stacking. So where this really gives you, it's only a JPEG, but it gives you a file that is already stacked. Here it's just saving the individual raw files. Um, I just think this is nicer because in some situations maybe the JPEG is enough and you still have the individual raw files if you want to use them. It also shows you the focal length in the viewfinder that you're using, which is very handy if you're using a zoom lens and you're filming and you don't know if you can still zoom more. And even for photography, sometimes I found it quite useful. And when shooting in backlit, I also enjoy this optical viewfinder simulation that also the R7 and the R6 Mark II have and also Nikon cameras, but the R5 is for some reason missing. So overall, I was very impressed with the R8. Of course, in many ways, it cannot compete with the R5, but it's also a whole different, uh, like a different class of camera. It comes at a completely different price point and it's much smaller. I was just impressed of how much it could do for this pr price point and was amazed how far entry level full frame cam cameras or particularly this one have come. So. I think as a backup camera, I can without any hesitation recommend this to anybody who already has another EOS R camera. As a second camera that you use kind of in parallel, it's a bit trickier because some of the buttons and dials are just in different places. So for example, I still often try to turn this camera off and actually just put it in video mode. So that's a bit trickier. Um, and maybe the most interesting one as your first camera, is this a good option? I think it really depends on what you want and most importantly on your budget because the price difference is quite crazy. And I think the value to price ratio, what you get for the money with this camera is really amazing and maybe maybe one of the best or the best in the mirrorless market right now. So in the end, you need to decide how much you want to spend on cameras and lenses. Um, but if I had the choice between an R5 with an RF 100 to 400, F5.6 to F8, or an R8 with a RF 100 to 500, 4.5 to 7.1L, I will clearly pick the R8 100 to 500 combination. I hope this gives you some kind of indication. So if you want to buy the R8, maybe check out the affiliate link below. It would really help my channel. And if you buy one, think about buying one or I would recommend rather two spare batteries because they really don't last too long. And the last thing you want is running out of power when you're out there having nice birds in front of your lens. And please also let me know if you would be interested in a setup guide, both for wildlife and landscape photography, specifically for the R8. Have a nice day and see you soon.